more time, amen? amen and amen. I tell you what, the worship team went in this morning, hallelujah. And they said, can't stop praising, won't stop praising, don't stop praising. Come on, give the Lord some praise in his house this morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of God this morning? I want you to loosen up. Some of you look like you're something hurt, amen. You all right? <laughs> Come on, loosen up. Let me see if you can, uh, some of y'all, some of y'all don't remember what that feel like. Loosen up a little bit. You're in the house of God in the presence of his people. God deserves glory and honor and the praise, and he is incredibly worthy. And let the church say real loud, amen. 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 Well, we're going to continue in our teaching series entitled Welcome Home. And so this week, our message is, is basically uh, a toolkit for you. We're going to give you, we're going to talk about those six items, those six tools that every family needs when they're under siege. Make no mistake about it. Today's families are under siege, now more than ever. I brought a few numbers. I know numbers don't always tell the story, but they do tell a story. Our families are facing some major challenges, everything from depression to anxiety to substance abuse to finances, even medical problems. And so then when a family goes through something, it finds itself under siege. Have you ever noticed that although we like to believe that we're independent, when one person in the family is going through something, it affects everybody else in the family? Anybody, anybody experienced that? Say, I have. It's true. There's nothing, there's nothing that you can do between the front door and the back door. If one of y'all is out of pocket, then it has a ripple effect, and the whole house is taken by hostage and taken siege. Here are a couple of things to consider. According to the United States Census Department, and the McKinley Family Law, a blog that I was reading the other day, a, a, a divorce occurs every 36 seconds. Every 36 seconds, somebody is filing for a divorce. So we did the numbers on those, and so then, if a divorce is occurring every 36 seconds, that means that there are t over 2,400 2, divorces every day. 1,600, almost 1,700 divorces a week and over 870,000 divorces a year. See, as quickly as families are starting, families are ending. The family is under siege. Did you know that 22% of the children in your circle live in homes below the poverty line? It's an amazing thing. Remember when you, maybe you were little, when you celebrated the end of the school year. Because, you know, it's summertime. And we, but in our culture today, many of the kids are not celebrating the end of the school year because it means that, because it means for them during the summer, they won't have anything to eat. Many of the kids going to school look forward to the, the breakfast and the lunch that the school provides because that's the only thing that they may eat that day. Somebody say, my Lord. I'm grateful to Crossroads Church. We're part, we're part. We're doing a small bit, and we're looking toward taking care of a, 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 an apartment complex in our community. And hopefully, we can we pull it off before we can do it again. And uh, providing sandwiches during the summertime. Come on, somebody, say that sandwiches in the summertime. See, some kids don't have anything to eat, and so then it's good. It's a good thing when the, when the people of God will move toward that depression affects 10% of adults in America today. Now, I used to think depression was, okay, um, I, I feel some kind of way, I'm feeling down, but it, fatigue, uh, uh, fatigue sometimes accompanies it, and, and, and emotional stress accompanies it. And here's the problem. If one person in the family is feeling some kind of way and going through something, it has a, a, a ripple effect throughout the entire family. 2.4 marriages for every, watch this, for every marriage, Every 2.4 marriages that this country has, one of them is going to end in divorce. Now, I got to tell you, those are pretty bleak numbers when you take a, big, good, a, a good look at the family. But here's the deal. God's got the family. Come on, somebody say amen. There is good news in the house of God today. God's got the family. Despite what the numbers say and what the word, the people on, on the streets say, God's got the family. Come on, if you believe that, give God some praise in his house today. God, not only does God have the family, God's got your family. Come on, look at the neighbor and say, you know God's got your family. Come on, somebody. Look at the, look at the neighbor that you weren't so, that wasn't your favorite, your first choice, amen. 
and tell them God's got your family. See, we have to understand something here. Yes, hard times will come, but there is a God who meets our needs. I wish I had a witness this morning. We have a God who cares about the family. We have a God who sustains the family. We have a God who can help the family when they're under siege. So, I want to do my small part this morning. I brought you something. When your family is going through something, amen, there's some, there are going to be some times when you have to, we, 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 when you have to take back territory. You see how I did that? I, 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 you have to take back territory. Listen to me carefully. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a victim. I'm not a victim. I am a victor of territory that's been taken. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. See, I love my daddy. I love my daddy, but he was an alcoholic, and I'm not. You know why? We took back territory. My family, high school diploma was something that only a few people got. I got two degrees. Come on, somebody. One, and, and praying about a doctor. Why? Because we're taking back territory. Oh, yes, okay. Some of y'all get this. The longest marriage. Oh, that's right. They didn't get married in my family. Amen. We had common law where we lived together and we call each other husband and wife. But I got a piece of paper that says I've been with first 30, 30 years. You know why? Because we took back territory. Come on, somebody. If you're sick and tired of your family being sick and tired, then you need to take back, come on somebody, the territory that the enemy has taken from you. Listen to me carefully. That's all right. I got one person to go with me this morning. Listen to me carefully. You do not have to be broken because the rest of your family is broken. You do not have to be a victim because the rest of your family has been victimized. Oh, that's okay. I'm, I'm going to jump in because I, I, I'm excited this morning about the healing that's going to take place when you take God at his word and do like he's asking you to do this morning. I brought with me a family toolkit. And so if you are, I want every family to have this before we begin our message time together. If you're in the house today and you're single, then you're a family. If you're in the house today and you represent your family, you want to represent your family, raise your hand and our greeters and ushers are going to come by and give you your family survival toolkit. Raise your hand high because I didn't tell you that's going to be $29.95 per kit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Keep your hands up. Amen. Amen. <laughs> just, that's just kidding. That was a bad joke. Amen. <laughs> That's just a bad joke. It's only $5.99. I was just trying to, I know where you work, amen. So we don't want to take you out of your pocket, out of your comfort zone. Get you one of these. I brought these for you today, and we're going to take, we're going to use this as an object lesson. I guess we can use that word today so you can understand what God's got in store for your family. Get one of these, and here's what I want you to do. At the end of today's message, I want you to go home and take pictures of the items or snap it and post it and tweet it and do what you do on your social media. But I want you to tag Crossroads Church so that our social media director can gather and, and of course, um, work with those things. And so um, here we go. Let me, let, me, let me help you out. I brought six tools from Scripture that I want to give you today to help your family overcome the siege. Listen to me now. If your family's not un currently under a siege, you ought to praise God. If things are going well, you ought to you should stand and shout right now. I got time. Amen. Because the truth of the matter is, there's going to be a season when you're going to have to go through something. Anybody had that season at least once this year? I want to see who I'm talking to. Anybody in that season right now? Amen. So here we go. Let's take a look at what God has to say. All right. When your family is, finds itself under siege, it's imperative that you do a couple of things. Some of the times we're so busy focusing on, focusing on what's broken that we can't see God's solution staring us in the face. Check this out. Number one, right out the gate, I want you to manage communication. So the first item in your toolkit is a rock. Now, as a little boy, rocks had one purpose. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Anybody? Little girl. Some of y'all were bad, too. Don't look at me like that. Rocks had one purpose, and that was for what? Throwing. And so then, repeat after me. Rocks are not for throwing. They are for building up. See, watch this. This same rock, when put in a, when, when put in a pile, can become a foundation for healing. This same rock, when put in a pile, can be a foundation for growth. 
Come on, this same rock and the proper power can be the foundation for a breakthrough. Rock, the rocks here in your toolkit also represents words. I'll say it again. Words aren't for throwing, they are for building up. Just like rocks, when you throw words around indiscriminately, somebody in your house is going to get hurt. I want to show you Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for the edification according to the need of the moment. Listen to me, as it relates to words, timing is everything. Timing is everything. If you know one of your children has, is horrible at something, you don't want to pick the wrong time to tell them how horrible they are. For example, your little boy loves basketball and he can't shoot a lick. Come on, amen. I remember one of my boys was playing baseball and one, of the co one lady on the team thought her son was a third baseman. I'm going I'm to thought her son. So she bugged the coach and begged the coach. And, and every ball went to the little boy. Went, he turned around chasing it. And I was like, wow, he is not a third baseman. So we got beat down so many times it was just ridiculous. So I, when your child has been beat down and the score in a basketball game is 85 to 2, that's not a good time to say, you know, you are horrible at basketball. The Bible says, according to the need of when, the moment. Now, I want to I I share something with you. Mama used to say, if you can't say nothing good, listen to me carefully. There are some times, and see, I'm one of those folks that, you know, I, I got the gift of gab, so to speak. So there's always a word on my heart, Amen. <laughs> And so there's sometimes when I know that what I'm about to say is going to be negative. So here's my replacement word. You ready for it? You know, pay attention. I want you to listen real deep. Here we go. Sometimes I go, hmm, hmm. <laughs> Come on, on three. One, two, three. See, you know how to do that. Amen. See, I'm just talking and talking. You say something stupid. I go, hmm. <laughs> Paul said that's, that's Bible. Listen, sometimes if you, need, you just need to be... Why yet? And I know you got to say something, so when you find yourself words bubbling up and you know you ought not say them, just say, hmm. Paul says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment. Here's why. So that it will give grace to those who hear. He says, I need you in times of crisis. Remember where we are. Your family is going through something. This is not the best time for you to say, I feel like whatever I say, I feel like saying, Pastor, that's the most immature thing that I've ever heard. There's sometimes when grown folks know how to be quiet. Babies are the only ones that spew out foolishness just because they can. Words have two effects. Here we go. Basically two after effects. Paul says they're either going to build somebody up or they're going to tear somebody down. Paul uses a three-letter word here that's very powerful. He uses the word let. He says, let no one wholesome word. Here's the implication. Words cannot get out unless you give them permission to get out. Let's be honest about it. You don't have to speak on every subject known to man. You can be quiet. The question is, do you want to? He says here that the word let, watch this, is a negation of will. What he's saying here is that you have to, uh, will doesn't get to release itself on its own. You have to negate your will. It may be a situation where you really want to say something, but you have to put your will in check. Look at the two types of words here that accomplish two different types of after effects. There are some words that he calls the words that tear down. These are unwholesome words. For those of you who take the, car, the garbage can to the side of the road, you already know what a putrid smell is like. After sitting in the Georgia sun for a week and you're dumping garbage in there, there is a horrible smell. Anybody who does that, say amen if you know what I'm talking about. 
It's a horrible smell. Paul said that is how your words affect people when they're tearing them down. They have a putrid smell. On the other side of the spectrum, Paul said words are used to build up. He uses the word edification. In the original language, this means to that this means that there is a completion of a building process. When you are strategic, when your family's in a tough time, you got to be more strategic with your words. Listen to me carefully. When you're building a house, the builder doesn't put the roof in first and then build everything underneath it. He starts with the foundation and then he puts a frame up, et cetera, et cetera. So as you are communicating with your family in a crisis, how about you think about the message? Wow, praise God. I just had this conversation this morning. How about you think about the message that you're going to say before you say it and you lay a foundation for it and then you put a frame. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then you then you put the sheetrock in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the time you get to the roof, then you can bless somebody. Some of us go straight to the roof. And you break people in the process. And when your family's going through something, you if your family's going through something, uh, attack under siege on the outside, you got to be real careful to manage your words on the inside. You don't want to be hit on two fronts. Amen, somebody. Proverbs 12. The Proverbs writer says in verse 18, there is one, look at this person, who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. He says, there's somebody who just spews Basically, he's saying somebody who's babbling, somebody who doesn't think about what they're saying. And he said, this person is equivalent to someone sticking a, a sword in, into you and just constantly, constantly, constantly doing damage to you. But on the other side of the coin, he says, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. See, when the wise people know when to speak, when not to speak, and what to say. I love my Grandmother. It seemed to me that she was a sage because she always had a word, a right now word. Somebody say right now word. See, right now word considers the situation and the circumstances and then it speaks. When your family's going through something, you got to be real careful. Your rock in your packet and your survival kit is to remind you that I got to be careful that my words are not tearing people down. That my words are hopefully building people up. Second item in your toolkit. When your family finds yourself under siege, it's imperative that you recruit recovery. That you recruit recovery. There is a misnomer that recovery is going to show up at your house and just ring your doorbell. I know so many people say, what are you doing? I'm waiting on Jesus to come by and bring you. I'm just going to wait on the Lord. As if that's something special. I'm just going to wait on the Lord. Now, sometimes it's a cop out, say cop out, because God has already told you what you need to do. I'm sorry if that's you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, and you know it, you just don't want to do it, amen. So your word is, I'm gonna wait on the Lord. But see, recovery for your family's not just gonna show up at the doorstep, you're gonna have to go out and recruit it. I brought you an item, I brought you this rubber band as a reminder of something. God may stretch you incredibly but you got to know something. He won't let you break. Come on, somebody. So you, just because your family goes through something doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of your family. See, the rubber bands have an uncanny capacity to do what? Snap back. See, here's what happens. Why is this important? If you don't deal, if you, if you don't snap back, you're going to give your past permission to hijack your future. See, when your family goes through something, you have to say to yourself, you know what, this is just a season. Say season. See, listen to me carefully. I've been in Georgia a long time, and somebody puts it this way. I even got a little twang in my time. Now I got a long time. Amen. <laughs> when I first came, it was long time. Now it's a long time. Amen. And here's what I've noticed. If you don't like the weather, somebody say, wait a while. It will change. This week, I was looking in my, just looking out the window of my house, and the sun was shining, and birds were chirping, and in the distance, it was thundering and lightning. I was like, this is crazy. But listen to me carefully. You cannot let, you cannot let your family be stuck in a, in, in, in a mode in which you, you, you have to understand something. You have to go after recovery. If there's somebody you're mad with in the house, you got to approach them and have a conversation. I know I'm messing with somebody right now. It's not going to get better because you walk past each other for three days. Oh, that's okay. I better get back to the text. 
Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. See, if you don't snap back, from the, you'll give your past permission to sabotage what God holds for you in the future. Look at Philippians 3. Paul said, you've seen this passage before. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. Repeat after me. There is purpose in my pressing. See, you cannot wait on recovery. You have to press through some things. I remember recently I was talking to my doctor about a few things. And he said, Mr. Boone, you're just going to have to press through. I said, what about this? He said, you're going to have to press through. And I got home. I said, you know what? There is purpose in my pressing. Amen. You get stronger. Listen to me. Every trial your family goes through makes you stronger than you were before. Oh, somebody don't get that. Amen. You think it was a break. It was a breakup and God used it as a breakthrough. Watch this. Philippians 13, verse 13. Brethren, chapter three. I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching toward what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love where Paul said, I'm on a mission to be what God's designed me to be. But he said, in order for that to accomplish, in order to accomplish that, I've got to move beyond. I have to forget those things which are beyond, but behind. We have no problem forgetting those things behind us that were horrible. We don't want to take bad memories into the future. So we have no problem, saints of God, not thinking about those things that hurt us in the past. But Paul is also talking about, though, he says, not only do you have to move beyond the things that went, went, went horrible for you, you have to find a way to move beyond the things that went well for you. See, listen to me carefully. You might not, you may not stay with me. Past success can prolong your family's siege if you keep turning around to look at it. Past success can impact your family's uh, prolonged, the, long, the length and the amount of time you're in a siege if you keep turning around and look at the good old days. Let me give you a couple of examples. When a wife starts off a sentence and says, when I live with my father, not a good way to start off a conversation with your husband, amen. As I, told, as I told the first lady, uh, you got a new daddy, so amen. Some of y'all going to have to work with that, amen. Come on, somebody. I, that's all right. I said, I did say that. Yes, I did. I don't care about your father. You got a new daddy. Come on, somebody. And if you ain't told your wife, you might have to turn to him and say, hey, you got a new daddy. I don't know what. I don't want to hear about your father. Here it is. When I lived with my daddy, we never had the lights turned out. You got a new daddy. I don't know what. My dad never told my mama, I told you, girl, yeah, I'm not your, you got a new dad. Electricity was a cent a kilowatt back in the day. Come on, I know that lights were never turned off. The bill was $3. Some of y'all don't get that. I got another one. When I lived with my mama, she was never tripping about what time I came in. Well, now you're living with your daddy, baby, so we got curfew around here. Amen. See, you cannot, here's an incredible truth. God is moving you forward to do something new. But in order to move forward, you're going to have to face forward. You can't always keep looking backwards with the expectation that you're going to find something. You come on. In order to move, repeat after me. In order to move forward, you've got to face forward. And sometimes we, we, I wish it were like it was. It will never be that way. Come on, somebody. Quit tripping. Can I say that in church? Amen. Quit tripping. You cannot allow the past to dictate your future. Whether things went well in the past or whether things were broken, you got to move on. Paul said, I press on. When your family's going through something, you have to recruit recovery. You have, have to put yourself in a position, come on somebody, to recruit recovery. You're going through divorce, start reading novels about folk breaking up. Amen. <laughs> You're watching programs with, I just... Turn to something new. How about turn off the TV? Huh? That's, a, that's a novel solution. God's trying to do something new. Paul says there is a secret to snapping back like a rubber band. Verse 12. He says, I got to be honest where we are as a family. 
He says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. What Paul is saying here, what was Paul, what was Paul seeking in this text? I believe in a word, Paul was seeking maturity. Paul was saying, I'm not as mature as I need to be yet. See, if your family is going to become mature through the siege, you're going to have to press on. See, recovery takes time. We live in a fast food world where everybody wants to fix everything. When husbands and wives are at odds, it's going to take time to fix that relationship. When children and family and mothers and parents are at odds, it takes time to fix that relationship. When you and I may aren't getting along, it's going to take time. And most people want to bail out too soon and you're tempted to stop. And I got news for you. When you're ready to quit on your recovery, you're probably very close to your recovery. So you have to stick in there with God. Paul also said, I got to press on. He also said, I must forget what he says here. I no longer care for that memory. What he's saying to me, what I think he's saying is you need to stop cherishing broken memories. Some of us can't press toward recovery because we're in love with telling that story over and over again how you were hurt. I use the illustration all the time. The little bitty boy who had a, um, a, a boo-boo and so it grew a scab and his mom put her um, uh, a uh, band-aid on it. And every time they had someone come to the house, Roy, he would pull it off. And what happens when you pull it off? You tear up the scab and it bleeds again. And he said, you, I want you to see my boo-boo. Oh, I want you to see my boo-boo. And so it never would heal because he was always, and some of you are just like that little baby boy. Every time somebody, how you doing? Well, you know, when 29, I was hurt by somebody. I said, 29? It's 19, it's 2018, baby, what? Sometimes you have to, watch this, I do not regret as having laid hold of it yet, watch this, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what? At some point the past needs to be left in the past. I'm not saying it wasn't important, I'm not saying it didn't hurt, I'm just saying it's not relevant to your healing. We must press on. We must forget. He also said we have to strain at the end of the race. I know you've watched a race, race or two. At the very end of the race, you see a person running neck and neck, and then you'll see the person who wins does something. They don't stand straight up thinking, I think I can outrun them. What do they do? They lean in and they, and they stress. And see, some of us haven't got our healing because we're jogging. So God said, I need you to lean in. Amen, somebody. I need you to see the finish line and hustle until you get there. And don't just, you need to fall. I've seen runners running so fast. They lean in. They tumble when they get to the finish line. I don't care how you get to the finish line. I just need you to get there. Paul said, I need you to press on, I need you to forget, and I need you to strain toward what he has for you. So the rubber band then is a, is a reminder to pursue recovery so you can snap back from the past so that you don't give it permission to hijack your future. Item number three. I brought you, and you couldn't pay me $1,000 to eat one of these, an atomic fireball. Anybody like these? I got a whole bunch of them. In my, you want anybody? I can give you about ten of these. I got a box full. At Amen. I wouldn't eat this if you gave me fifty-five dollars because it's just too hot. When they when we took the lid off of them and we were making your making your package, they, they, they filled up the room. I said, I can't be in here. I can't be in here. It smells hot. Amen. So <laughs> they're so hot. What are they? What are they reminder of? Okay, the atomic. Fireball is a reminder that during times of siege, every family member must make an effort to, the, to get a grip on his or her emotions. When your family's going through something, it changes your emotions. I know I, I, do, I do quite a bit of self-disclosure here, but I, it, my life is the one that's closest to me, and I know about it. I recently went to dinner with my wife. And she said, can I talk to you about something? And I, that always means husbands. You know what that means. Like, oh, Lord, what did I do now? <laughs> and so I was ready. She said, you seem a little angrier than usual. I was like, wait, than usual? So you mean I'm angry <laughs> all the time? I'm trying to figure out how you're trying to bless me with this. Work with me. And she said, I just, she said, I think your continual battle with this whole health thing you're battling with, I think it's starting to, pre starting to press on your emotions a little bit and on your spirit a little bit. And I said, wow, because she was right. Amen, somebody. 
And I said, you know what, I apologize. I never realized that she said, you know, it's the, I, says, I think you have to be okay with pulling aside because we ask questions and we're telling you things. She said, you need to pull aside and just be with God and be still with God so that you'll know that he's still God. And you don't have to answer every question. You don't have to be in charge of everything. You don't have to be strong. And if you feel like crying, cry. Come on, somebody. Did I choose well? Come on, somebody. Amen. So then during the time when we're going through something, you have to guard your emotions so you don't wound everybody around you. You don't believe me. Proverbs 25 puts it this way. Verse 28. The New King James Version. Whoever does not rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Repeat after me. Boundaries. Come on, I didn't hear you. Boundaries. See, emotions require boundaries. God made you, some of you are a hothead all the time. You're not going through something. You're just mean. Amen. I would say turn to your neighbor and say that's you, but I don't want to get anybody in trouble. You and I have to understand something, that God gave us emotions. God himself is an emotional being. I want to prove it to you. Jeremiah 13 and 3 says, God displays love. The Lord appeared to him, this is Jeremiah, from far away. He says, I've loved you with what kind of a love? An everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. So God says, God here clearly is capable of the emotion called love. Psalms 103 tells us he also is capable of the emotion called compassion. Psalms 103 verse 13. Just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. This is important on a parental level. You have to know that who your children are. You have to know their frame. You have to know that they are just dust. And when you understand that people are going to be people, you can handle your emotions a little better. Remember the story I gave you last week where the gentleman said he was upset because his wife didn't fill up the ice cube trays. Remember that? And so he went in there. Some of y'all looking, looking down. That's you. I see some of y'all like, who? they're always filled up when you go in the refrigerator. Have you ever wondered how that happens? Hey, man, just floating it out there. Didn't get much talk back. So he goes in, gets the ice tray, realizes that it's half full. He says, I'm sick and tired of this woman. She don't love me. She keeps, she keeps, these, keeps using up all the ice. And so he said, I want to see how long it takes. Remember, I told you, he, he said he's filled up. He was standing there in front of the, in front of the sink, and he's saying 1,001, 1,002. He got to seven, and it was filled. He said, seven seconds. All I need her to do is to love me for seven seconds and to fill up this doggone ice tray. And she don't love me. And we go down the road. Now he's an atomic ball, atomic fireball, and he's upset about seven seconds. And he was about, he, I think he, he approached his wife, and he came to the conclusion Wait a minute, am I going to let, am I going to ruin the peace in my household for seven seconds? Well, this morning I was looking for something that I purchased for $8. And it wasn't where I left it. And I'm like, I'm so sick of these people in this house. So don't look at me like that. <laughs> Always touching my stuff and I'm just telling you what, I'm going to hunt them down and whoever got it going, ooh, boy, ooh. And then I heard the Lord, the Spirit of God say, $8. You're going to ruin the peace in this house. So I'm okay a little bit. <laughs> With my thing being moved from where it was. Somebody, I'm, hey, I'm, 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 I'm going to, quote, manage my communication. But there will be communication about my peace that got moved. If you believe me, come on, you with me, say Amen. I want to show you Jesus had emotion. He was actually angry. Take your Bible to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 verse 14. See, emotions aren't an evil thing. You just have to manage them, build a fence around them and safeguard them. John chapter 2 verse 14. We see the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Every poster I've ever seen, every, every portrait, every um, icon, every image I've ever seen of Jesus, He's just standing there with his hand out, peace and tranquility. His hair is just coming down, and even the wind not even blowing on. He just looked like he's just calm as he can be. 
Well, that's a lie. He got angry. I'm sure there were peaceful times, but look at verse 16. Don't take my word for it. Verse 14. Jesus, this is him. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves. And the money changers were seated at the tables. You have to understand what's going on here. In the house of God, there was a marketplace. In order to remove your sin, you had to sacrifice an animal. So that somebody had set up inside the temple a rate of exchange where you could exchange your foreign money for the current money. Or you can buy a dove or an oxen or something. So there were businessmen, there were, uh, um, there were vendors, <laughs> like it was a vendor show inside the house of God selling animals. Verse 15, Jesus saw him and he made a scourge of cords. This reminded me, we were on a ride, the Faith Riders, last, uh, last a week or two ago, and we had this discussion, maybe you can get in on it. Does anybody here ever had to go, ever told by your mama, grandma, auntie, daddy to go get a switch? I'm just trying to see who I'm working with. Anybody remember that? And you better not bring back a little bitty one with a bunch of green leaves on it. Right? Because what would happen? Yes, sir. So Jesus, in our text, the Bible says, verse 15, he made a, a scourge of cords. Literally, he th took three leather pieces and tied them into a braid. It, it became a whip, really. And what did he do with it? He drove them all out of the temple. The word drove in the Greek means drove. Amen. Amen. <laughs> He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. Can you imagine? Jesus started whooping and animals running and bleeding and oxen's running around. And I, if he's anything like, like the whoopings that I've got, he didn't care where he was hitting. Arms, leg, back. I learned early on that you better cover your head when my mama started swinging because she could care less where she hit you. It wasn't a box ox. It was wherever she didn't. I tell you not. I was like, wow, this woman... The Bible says Christ was so angry that he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He goes on to say he poured out the coins of the money changers and then he turned over the tables. See, emotion is something that drives you. Can I say, I can't say Jesus act a fool, but emotion could drive you to do something that you cannot undo. Mm. Look at this. Verse 16. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business, a house of merchandise. We see the meek and mild and lowly Jesus Christ from a different angle. He made a switch, a whip. He used it across their backs and their arms and their legs. He poured out their money. He turned over their tables and he yelled at them at the top of his voice, get out my father's house. Now, he did all this from the place I told you of boundaries. See, because without boundaries, emotions can become red hot. But Jesus, and if you don't keep them in the proper boundaries, they'll do damage. Look at verse 17. So what was the boundary for Christ? Verse 17. His disciples remembered that it was written. Look at this. Zeal for your house will consume me. The word, when you see the word zeal here, it's a deep concern or devotion towards someone or something. Zeal means you're deeply concerned about it. And consuming means it's a figure of extension of thought that it eats you up. So then you're, you're gone, you, it's all over your mind to the point, your zeal is all over your mind to the point that your actions become so, so, uh, so you, you begin to act out out of anger. But here's something that you got to notice. Jesus' anger wasn't reckless anger. It was because they were turning his father's house into a house of merchandise. There are some things that you ought to be mad at, mad at but seven seconds or eight dollar thing that's missing in the family is not one of them. Stay with me here. The next time your family's under siege and you get upset about something little, ask yourself, is this thing worth wrecking the peace of this house? And I'm going to give you the answer. No, it's not. 
Jesus' zeal was according to his purpose to do God's will. So I brought you the atomic fireball to remind you to safeguard your emotions. Emotions are actually a gift from the Lord, but they got to be properly managed so that you won't injure somebody that you really do love. If you're still with me, say amen. Come on, let me hear you. Number one, what's the first thing in your toolkit? Uh, what's the first item in your toolkit? And, what is it, what, and so what is it supposed to remind you to do to manage what? Very good. What's the second item in your toolkit? And what does it remind you to do to recruit what? Snap back, right? Number three, what's the, what's the third item I gave you? I got some extra ones if somebody wants some. I'm not trying to get them out of my car. What does that remind you of? Safeguard your emotions. Watch this. It gets fun. It gets more, uh, more, more fun as we go here. Number four, the fourth thing in your item. I brought you in your family survival kit. I brought you sweet tart because I want you to remember that people are designed differently. Some of us are naturally sweet. I'm, I'm not looking over here when I say this. And some of us are naturally sour. Everybody in your family has different personalities. Take your Bible to Genesis chapter 25. I want to show you. <laughs> some of y'all are naturally sweet and some of you are naturally sour. And I'm not sure why God does it, but he always matches a sweet person with a sour person. I cannot figure it out. I think he, I, I think he just pops popcorn and just watches your house and say, like, wow, this is going to be good today. I'm just... I just can't figure that out. Of course, I'm naturally sweet, which means nothing, which means nothing. Genesis 25, I'm the sour one. First lady sweet, I'm like, whatever, whatever. <laughs> she finds good in everything. I'm like, mm, I don't know. Genesis 25, verse 24. Listen, God's grace is sufficient. I know it. Amen. He, he helped me to be a... Um, Married above my pay grade. Genesis 25, 24. Check this out. When her days were to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Remember, during times of crisis, you got to appreciate every personality. Now, the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. And afterward, his brother came forth, and his hand was holding on to Esau's feet. So they called him Jacob or supplanter, or one who holds down, or holds back, or attaches himself to. And, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. I was like, Lord Jesus, please don't bless me like that. <laughs> Twins at 60? That ain't a blessing. I'm going to be asking y'all, do y'all need any extra kids? We got two. Anybody? I know their parents. They'll be all right. Do y'all need any? I can't do it. He was 60 years old, which means his wife had to be 59. Verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. These twin brothers had the same parents, but they had different temperaments. One was a guy who was a wilderness man on the outside, and the other was an intellectual, indoors man writing poetry and drawing pictures. Here's a painful truth. Sometimes, as parents, we do play favors. We tend to gravitate toward those kids who are most like us. I remember I was invited to go on a conference with one of my brothers. And I knew the Spirit of God said to me, you need to talk to him about something. Every time our, our families were together, I noticed something. There was one of the boys, he was kind and gentle with, and the other boy he kind of rebuked, just found a way to rebuke him. And so I'm sitting in the car headed out of town thinking, mind your own business, Boone, and leave people alone, and you have nothing, you shouldn't be saying anything. And I remember the passage of scripture, Ian, that said, iron sharpens iron. And I knew then that it would be wrong for me not to speak up, because this was a very prominent man who has a very big church and he was doing great things for God. And I said, you know what? I don't want this to come back. So me and my big mouth, I said, listen, I want to share something with you. And I feel like I may be crossing boundaries, but I love you and you're my brother. 
And uh, I just want to say this. He said, go ahead. I said, I noticed that one of the boys is the object of your affection and the other one is the object of your scorn. The one who's athletic, you're all over him and he's the best thing. And the other one who's an art artist and does things and plays the guitar, all that good stuff. True story. And then I shut up. And then there was silence. It seemed like it was three days worth of silence when he, he didn't say anything. And he was driving and he said, you know what? You're right. He said, I have not noticed it. But now that you say that, I can give you instances when I was that way with that boy. And so he said, let me say this to you, Pastor. I appreciate you. Um, and you said you, it wasn't your, you were out of your lane or whatever. He said the same thing. He said, you know what? Iron sharpens iron. And he said, I appreciate you being. He said, many guys won't say that to me. And he said, this is why I love you as my brother, because you'll, you'll speak the truth in love. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord some praise. I'm, I, I tell you this really long story to get down to verse 28. Now, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebecca loved Jacob. It doesn't say because, but mama was in love with the guy who was an indoors guy. And the daddy loved the guy who brought him some good meat to eat. And so then we and I, you and I as parents, have to be very, 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 very careful when, we're, when our family's under siege that we don't gravitate toward the people in the house who agree with us or who are okay with us or who are just like us to the, to the neglect of everybody else in the house. Somebody say amen. Doctor, doctors, Gary Smalley and John Trent, pretty much narrow down people into four different personality types. I get it. You can't put people in a box. And many people are a hybrid of many things, which you might want to scribble these down. I've given them to you before, but I think it's pertinent again. In your situation at your house, there are four kinds of people that live in your home. There are some people who represent, and you're all animals, some people who represent a lion, L-I-O-N. And this person is very dominant. This person is very decisive on the positive end. They're very decisive. On the negative end, they can be pretty cruel to everybody else. And so then, here's the thing to understand. I happen to have several lions who live in my, in, my, in my family. And so then I discovered something, and this is important for you who have teenagers and, and middle schoolers and older adult children. When a person has a, per, a dominant lion kind of a personality, you cannot tell them what to do. All this thing about I, I pay the bills and, you know, and I, there's mail with my name in on the mailbox and all that good, all the stuff I always say. I discovered, discovered something really quickly. For the dominant personality, all they did was fight back. If I said there are three doors and you need to choose door number one, they would choose door number five, which wasn't even on the list. Because they got that strong personality. And here's what they said. You're not going to tell me. Some of you, I'm looking at some lions now shaking their head. That's right. You don't tell me what to do. I make my own decisions. And it happens, they don't, they don't get this personality at 16, they get it at six. Come on somebody, and you have to understand what you're working with. Then there, are the, there is the other personality that the doctors Smalley and Trent call the otter, O-T-T-E-R. And the otter is a very influential, very outgoing, very charismatic person. People are drawn to this person and they're just, they're just that kind of person. They never have a lack of friends because they're so outgoing. But they all, on the negative side, they're very undisciplined. You can't, they are very, very undisciplined. And so you have to understand something. They have one skill on one hand, but on the other hand, you have to understand they're a bit undisciplined. You have to teach them then to become more disciplined. Then there is the retriever. This is the person in your house that's steady and easygoing. This is the person that has that Rodney King mentality. Why can't we just all get along? And this is the person who's the peacekeeper of your house. No matter what's going on, they find a way to make the, if we're going to bring peace. But the problem with this personality is that they pretend to be worriers. And so you have to let them know that God's grace is sufficient for every situation. So why am I mentioning this? One more and I'll tell you why. Then there is the beaver in your house. And this is a person who's compliant, well organized. This is a person who's a worker. They love checklists and they're always working and always about business. But they can be very critical of people who aren't like them. That's the person who, when you drop something on the ground, say, look at you. You know who wants to clean that up, don't you? Pick that up. 
This is the person who's going around the house with rules and regulations and always right. And if you're not always right, then you're less than. Why do I mention this to you? I put this sweetheart in your family survival kit so that you can remember something. Everybody's personality is not like yours. And if you're going to have an impact on your family, you're going to have to find out where they are and you're going to have to treat them from that place. Can I have an amen? If you have an outgoing otter, then you have to say, listen, yes, we're going to go play baseball. Yes, we're going to do kickball, but I need you to pick up that room first and then we'll go. And so then they make the connection. OK, I got I, I got to give something to get something. But if you say clean up the room and, and then take them to six flags and the room's still a mess, then you're creating that monster. That's OK. I said it. That's the monster. And my boss used to say, the monster you feed is the monster you got to live with. So during crisis times, you need to appreciate the personalities. Number five, we're almost there. The fifth thing you got to remember when your family's under siege is that you have to expect healing. It amazes me how many families no longer expect God to move. And they're pretty much saying, this. it is what it is. I hate that. It's not, it's not, it is what it is. God's going to move. God can move. I brought you a Band-Aid to remind you to expect healing in your family. Yes, things may be bad, but God, there is no situation. Remember, there's no situation. There is no siege that has overcome your, your family unless God has given it permission to touch you. Well, some of you don't want to hear this, but anything you're going through, God has to first approve it before it touches you. Does anybody remember the story of Job? Job went and, uh, I'm sorry, Satan went and said, the only reason Job was praising you is because things are going well for him. And the moment things stop going well for him, he's going to curse you to your face. And God said, go ahead, do whatever it is you think you need to do. There are some things that we are going through as families that the enemy has said, if you do this, this family's not going to make it. And God said, I've seen how strong they are. Go ahead, do your best. Come on, somebody, because you have to expect a healing. Come on, give the Lord some praise in his house. I know who they are. Go ahead, do your best. Nobody likes trials and tribulations, but every time I go out of one, every time you go through one, you're stronger than where you went in. Don't miss this. Come on, somebody. If God allowed your family to go in, he's already planned your way out. You know what happens? We have selective amnesia. In the middle of something, we think this is the worst thing we've ever went through. Except, and then the last time, we thought that was the worst thing we've ever. And the time before that, this is the worst thing I've ever been through. When in truth, God let things in and he brought you out. I wish you would say that with me. Although he lets things in. Come on. He's already planned your way out. Who needs a way out this morning? Come on, I'm telling you, you need to expect the healing. I'm not sitting around anymore hoping and thinking and dreaming. I'm expecting God to move in my situation. I'm counting on God to move in my situation. I'm, I'm asking God to move in my situation. I remember recently we went to a doctor's visit and we were doing our thing and talking about the Lord and talking about each other and doing our back and forth and breakfast in the news and things like that. And so we were, this nurse was seeing us, and I never will forget it, and she asked us, who are y'all? We're like, we are Mr. and Mrs. Boone. Do we owe you any money? Amen, because we don't know. <laughs> we the Smiths if we owe you some money, but. <laughs> and we didn't recognize the girl. We thought maybe she'd come or whatever, but she was listening to our conversation. She said, what do y'all go to church? I said, well, we. I'm a pastor, Dr. Lash. She said, okay, I'm looking for a church. I just moved into the area. We said, okay, come and see. Last Last week, two weeks ago, she comes through these doors of this church. Come on, somebody, because I expected my healing at the doctor's office. She said, I got to come and see. Amen. Uh, amen, somebody. You've got to live your life as if God, you got to sit on the edge of your seat as opposed to sitting back saying, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Scoot up to the edge of the seat so you can get a good view of what God's about to do next. Watch this. Take your Bible to Luke chapter 6. I'm hustling. Luke chapter 6. I brought you this band-aid so you remember that there is no siege that God cannot fix when he gets good and ready. Amen. Luke chapter 6 verse 17. The Bible says, Jesus came down with them 
and stood on a level place. And there was a large crowd of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coastal regions of Tyre and Sidon. He had folks coming from miles around to see him. Verse 18 tells us what they actually came. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the people were trying to touch him. Why? For power was coming from him and healing them all. Wasn't it? What a pregnant verse. Notice who came in search of a healing. When you look at this list of people, there were disciples and apostles, leaders and church members, and even unbelievers had heard about the work of Jesus, so they came toward his direction. Notice what they did. They came to hear him and they came to touch him. See, when your family's under siege, you need to take them in the direction of the Lord. I don't know why it is that when people are going through something, I've seen it happen over the years, the first thing they cross off their list is attendance on Sunday morning. And that should be the last place you abandon is the house of God. When you're going through something, I'm going to tell you something. I see people come in here. I, my brother Sean is back. Praise God. Give the Lord some praise. Pastor Sean's been out. <laughs> Sean is on crutches. But he came in like, nope, I'm coming in anyway. <laughs> Amen, somebody. I saw our worship director. She's been out for a, Lord, for a while. Praise the Lord. She's back. She had some things going on with her. And she sat. She said, Pastor, I'm going to sing one song. She sat over here, she sang, she said, I'm going to sit down at the rest of us. Amen, baby, sit down. Listen to me. These are folks who couldn't wait to get back in this little, this little brown building. Amen. When you are going through something, you've got to attach yourself to the house of God. It's a place of healing. It's a place of help. Watch this. And somebody in the seat next to you may have just come through what you're in the middle of. And so then you need to connect and touch. They came to Jesus to hear him. They came to Jesus to touch him. Notice their condition. They were diseased and they were in trouble. Notice the healthy folks didn't come toward Jesus because they didn't need him. But I'm going to tell you something. Let, let controversy hit your family. You'll find the Lord. Notice the method of Christ's healing. Power came out of him. Do you know how releasing, how, 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 how beneficial that is to understand something? The power for your healing doesn't have to come out of you. Can I be honest? Some days you don't feel like it. Who am I talking to? You're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you're sick as, uh, Pastor Sean now it's on the phone sharing war stories. You're like, love, we didn't have Jesus. I don't know what we do. Amen. Because sometimes in the mind you're tired. You're physically tired. Your heart is tired. Your attitude is tired. Your spirit is tired. And then you can't, and so then the good news is the power for your healing doesn't come out of your tired self. It comes out of the Lord. Amen. The Bible says power came out of him. Notice who this healing was available to. It says his desire was to heal them all. Let, let me let you in on something. Your family is on the list. Can I have an amen? Your family is on that list. God wants to move forward, but you have to expect him to move. I'm, I'm walk, you want you to walk from a place of expectancy. There are some things that seem so tough that you'll never be able to get over them, but God's got your back. The problem is, somebody said this to me the other day, instead of focusing on how heavy the load is, you need to focus on the one who's helping you to carry it. Mm, that's good. That's good. We are focusing on the weight on our back, but we really are, if you, if you looked around, you see Jesus got three-fourths of it, and you just got a little bit of it, and you whining. Amen, somebody. I'm at a place in my life where I expect God to do what only he can do. So I brought you a band-aid to remind you and your family that no wound is too big for God's healing power. You just got to keep seeking him. Finally today, the last piece in your toolkit is a puzzle. <laughs> I don't have a clue why somebody would take a thousand pieces of a disconnected picture and spread them all out and spend the next five days hunting blues, yellows, and greens. I, come on, who, which one of you puzzle people? I, 
I just need to, uh, bless your heart, amen. I'm sitting here thinking, what in the world? My head hurt when they emptied it out. I was like, no, Jesus, I can't, uh-uh. <laughs> and I watched, I watched, um, first lady get some, I owe her money because I talk about her all the time. She take the corners and she get the corners and then she take the flat part and then the flat part and then she get the greens in one pile and the other. So I'm like, how many days? And so she finally gets a picture. And I remember, it was true story, we were on vacation and I know how to get some time. I buy a puzzle. Oh, Lord, she ain't here this morning. I just said that. I was like, mm, I need some time on vacation. I buy a puzzle, Roy. I get two days out of that. She don't bother me for two days. And I remember she got through this puzzle. It was hot air balloons. I never forget it. Hot air balloons. And then we got to the end of it, and a piece was missing. And she looking at me. I was like, now, you know I ain't touch nothing at the table. She looking at a purse. She looking at a car. She looking everywhere because watch this. Without that piece, the picture is incomplete. Oh, you've got you to know where I'm going. The piece in your family that will make your picture complete, his name is Jesus. You can put, come on somebody, you can put together every little part, your finances, your faith, your marriage is fine, but if that one piece is missing, your picture is incomplete. I brought you this, the puzzle piece is a reminder that God is the most valuable piece of your family's puzzle. You can attempt to restore your family without the help of the Lord, but it's a waste of time. You can go to counseling without Jesus, it's a waste of time. You can read books, listen to them on audio versions of them, without Christ, waste of time. You can watch every episode and the reruns of Dr. Phil over and over again. Without Christ, it's a waste of time. Look at Psalms 127.1. The Bible says, if the Lord does not build the house, do you see that? If the Lord does not build the house, the work of the builders is what? It's useless. If the Lord does not protect the city, notice the word useless again. It is useless for the centuries to stand guard. See, if, if it is useless to work so hard for a living, getting up early and going to bed late, for the Lord provides for those he loves while, they, while they're what? Asleep. It is useless for you to, uh, to believe that, the, that your family is going to, uh, your family's success and your family climbing out of the siege is only dependent upon what you can do. The Christ, I remember back in, I, I think it was around 2012 or 2013, we started saying this to ourselves around the house because we had gotten all tangled up. We're trying to work through some stuff. And we had got all tangled up and frustrated. And I, and I remember saying, you know, baby, we need to leave something for Jesus to do. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're going to get to a place in your family's survival where you're not going to be able to take you any further. And God said, I've been waiting on you to get here. I, I've been trying to tell you, let me have this. And so we, we started saying it over and over that year. When things didn't work out, I said, you know what? We're going to take our hands off of that. We need to leave something for Jesus to do. I'm not being presumptuous here saying that, that we had it until Jesus kept he kept it. He had it when we thought we had it. You know, I know that. But I'm saying at some point, you got to take your hands off of it. Family healing and restoration does come down to one choice. A tried and true uh, scripture, Joshua 24, 15. We're almost there. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today who you will serve, whether the gods which are your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. And Joshua said, very famous line, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Listen to me carefully. If your family's in the middle of a crisis situation, stop in your tracks and find a way to serve God. See, what happens is when you begin to dedicate yourself to serving God, you look back at your situation, it doesn't look as dark as you thought it did. But if all you're focusing on is what's broken, it's hard to see the light of the Lord. And so then your family has to figure out a way to serve God. It may, you may hear an announcement that Margie's house is giving away food. Pack everybody in the house, in the car on Saturday, and go out there. And when you meet a senior citizen who needs a bag of vegetables and, and, and they don't have anything to eat, when you get back in your car, you'll be a little different than the one before you came when you go back in your refrigerator and it's filled with stuff. Come on, somebody. When you, when, you, when you follow the faith riders underneath the church in Augusta that meets under the bridge, I'm not, I mean, their, their seats 
are, are folding chairs and there, there's no carpet. There's dust and dirt underneath the floor. And when you go on that homeless camp, come on, somebody serving God and you approach the church and you smell it before you see it. It'll change your family's trajectory. When you see these folks who have no money, I never will forget this. These folks who have no money, when the, when the, when the pastor said it's time for an offering, I said, really, bro, you're going to take an offering from folks who are homeless. And I watch people dig in purses and pockets and boots and come up with crumbled up dollars and change and stood in line. Come on, somebody, to give their offering to the Lord. You need to serve God when your family is going through something. It'll change your trajectory. We become, I feel like I'm fussing. We become too self-absorbing in our problems. We think we're not supposed to ever go through anything. But you got to understand something. In the middle of a crisis, find something to do for God. Joshua said it comes down to a choice. Door number one. You can choose to walk in the brokenness of your family history. Door number two. You can choose to keep watching TV and think your family's supposed to be like the Lifetime and BET families. Or door number three, you can choose healing and hope by making room for Christ, by understanding that Jesus is the missing piece to the healing and hope that your family's trying to see. I want to end with a challenge. Yeah, there's some messages where we get a little excited and we hoop and Kevin brings a bunch of music and we shout and we hoop. And there's some messages where I just end. But today I want to I want I want to do something a little different. I want to put a challenge on you. James said, don't just be hearers of the word. James said, I need you to be doers of the word. So if you find that this little kid was a little corny, amen. But here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to pull it out at dinner and gather as many folks as you can get together. And I want you to take out a piece at a time and have a family discussion about how are we doing? How are we doing with rocks? Are our words, are the words in this, build, in this house being used to throw at people or to build people up? Do you see where I'm going? How are we doing with tempers and personality? How are we doing with the personalities? How are we doing with an expectation, uh, amen, of God's healing? How are we doing with overcoming the issues of our past? And I guarantee God will meet you at your kitchen table and your family will learn something and your family will grow from the conversation. Give the Lord some praise in his house. <laughs> Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ. So we throw down the gauntlet today. And we ask those, Father, even if you have good friends of yours, and pull out the toolkit with your girlfriends or your guy friends and have a conversation and say, how do you see me? Am I a person who throws rocks or am I a person who's using rocks to build? And, and then be prepared for the answer. But I pray, Father, that, we'll, that your people will be challenged this week. Not just to come here and message, write down a few points and go on, go on about their business, but to, but to seek and recruit recovery by having open discussion and spending time together and talking about these things and making the adjustments when necessary. We thank you so very much, Father, for the practical aspect of your word today. We thank you, Father, for the healing that is on the other side of our obedience. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake we say, amen. If you're here today, and you've not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to grant you an opportunity to find the Lord today. And here's the important piece. This has, this has very little to do with religion. The relations, what Jesus wants with you is a relationship. Christ bled and died to restore the relationship. And if you're here today and you know you need the Lord, not about church, not about church people, all of us, church pastors, all of us are going to be in that same line. Amen. Well, 
Amen. And two different lives for the saved and the unsaved. But we're all going to have to give an answer to God for who we place our faith in, ourselves or Christ. So don't let what other folks are doing or saying or have done in the past ruin your opportunity to walk in the newness of life with Christ today. Is there anyone here? Anyone here? If you're prepared to accept the Lord, won't you stand? <laughs>